morning. Since Pastor Brian is in Guatemala and, you know, he had a, a long trip. He was supposed to get there, I believe, his Friday night. He had trouble with the connecting flight in Texas, so he had to spend the night in Texas. And he finally made it there last night. So praise God he's there. He's enjoying the, the new grandbaby, so I'm sure he's okay. It's all worth the trouble, right? But because he's there, you're stuck with me. <laughs> I told somebody earlier, that is no excuse to leave the building. <laughs> so I have told the guys to go lock the doors and nobody's leaving until we're done. <laughs> now before we get started, I want to introduce to you a special person in my life. It's the first time since I live in Florida that he's here with us. And that's my brother Tony. Tony, will you stand up? Give him a warm welcome. Yeah. And my nephew, Jose, is upstairs, uh, so you can't see him from here, but he's up there with, uh, with the other kids. So thank you for being here, guys. All right, let's go to what we came for. Anybody know what this is? The youth are probably going, uh, I have no idea. Well, let, let me open it for you. Maybe you'll know. See. Hey, what this is? This is a 1995 GPS. Yeah. You know, when I started in sales, you know, I had to go to this little map and mark here my territory and figure out where all my dealers were. And, you know, you had to know before you took off where you were going because otherwise it was very difficult to drive and read, you know. And uh, talk about texting and driving, right? We used to. Have the maps in the next seat. <laughs> I'm not going to go there. But, <laughs> but I love traveling. How many of you love traveling? Anybody here? Great, great. Now, before I go traveling normally, normally, I choose a destination where I'm going, right? And based on that destination, we choose which way to go, right? That's normally the case. Uh, every now and then, you know, my wife and I like to just get in the car and go and see where it takes us. But, but normally, we choose a destination and, and then we decide which way we're going to go. And, and it's very important to do that because the, destin the, the way you go to your destination depends on your goals, right? If you want to go sightseeing, well, you take maybe the longer road and, and you take more time to get there. But if you want to get there as quickly as possible, you, you need to know which road is shorter, which one is quicker, so that you can get there when you need to get there, right? I, I love doing that stuff. And... and uh, Every now and then, though, you choose a destination, you think you're going on the right way, and you're going the wrong way, right? It reminds me of a story, and I, I don't mean to offend my dad, and, and he won't get offended. But back in 1984, Xiomi and I got married in Massachusetts, and I got a map of Massachusetts. Can we put that map up there, guys? I have a map of Massachusetts, just in case you don't know about Mass. But over there to your right is Boston. You see it with an arrow? And then towards the middle, there's a city called Amherst. See it there with the red arrow? That's where Xiaomi and I met. We were going to college there at UMass in Amherst, and we met there. But we married in Massachusetts, and for the first time in his life, my father went from New York driving to Massachusetts for our wedding. You know, he picked up my aunt, and my, my mother was with him, and, and our friend Evelyn was with them. And he had a, a glorious trip. He can tell you about it sometime. You know, a man alone in the car with three women for four and a half hours. Glorious. <laughs> Glorious. Uh, but anyways, we got married, right? And the next day, they have to go back to New York. Well, my father gave the map to my Aunt Carmen. And Aunt Carmen decided what route to take to go from Boston to New York. And, and can we leave the map for a second? I'm sorry, guys. But... But if you see, I don't know if you can see it from there, but from Boston, if you go south, there's I-95, the same I-95 that comes all the way here. And normally you will take I-95 to go from Boston to New York City, which is in the left corner over here. But further up, like going towards Amherst, is I-90. And the problem is that when you're in Boston, I-90 also says New York. See, that day they took I-90. <laughs> and as they were driving... Two and a half hours into the drive, my mother, and the only way that my mother can do, yes, it's Amherst. We can go visit Joaquincito. That's how she used to call me. And at the same time, my father went, what? If we're close to Amherst, we're way off. 
where we need to be going, right? And the rest is history. We won't go there. It take too long. But every successful trip begins with a chosen destination, right? We're going to talk about traveling today. But we got, before we go to the matter at hand, I just want to, as a matter of review, I just want to go over real quick what we've been talking about. We've been talking about the Sermon on the Mount, right? And Jesus has been talking to his disciples and, and to some followers, and he's basically taken them to a crash course on biblical interpretation. You know, he took the interpretation of the, of the Pharisees that they have been taught and, and kind of took it to a different level. He kind of changed everything that they understood to be the law of God and how to interpret the law of God. And, and, and Jesus just flipped it around. He said, listen, you have heard that you can't kill somebody, but I'm going to tell you that if you even hate somebody, that's like killing. And you have heard that you should not commit adultery, but if you even look at a woman with lust in your eyes, you have committed adultery. So he kind of flipped what they had been instructed and with it, he flipped the disciples' world. And I can just imagine as we get to this chapter 7, that the disciples are looking at all these new laws that Jesus is giving them and saying, how in the world can we do this? How can we be good enough to earn the righteousness that God desires from us? But Jesus looks at them and says, listen. Christianity is not about doing the law. Christianity requires a heart. See, Christianity is about the heart. It is not about following a checklist of things to do and not to do. As a matter of fact, the Pharisees were experts at following the checklist. Right? Jesus tells the disciples in Matthew 5.20, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that, of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So can you imagine the look in their faces? Okay, he just told us that our righteousness have to exceed that of the Pharisees. He's taking the law and putting it at a different level. How in the world are we going to do that? This is difficult. See, obedience of the law with the wrong motives is useless in our righteousness for God. True obedience of the law, true obedience of the law is reflected in my behavior towards others. True obedience of the law is reflected in my behavior towards others. He says this in verse 12 of Matthew 7. He says, so whatever you wish that others will do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. You see, in kind of a summary, he says, so, therefore, because of everything I have told you this far, so, whatever you wish that others will do to you, do also to them. Man, as we see the news this week and every week, it seems like now, we have so many issues in this world nowadays, huh? And we're trying to put laws against everything that is going on, laws against discrimination, against racism, against this, that, the other. And let me tell you, the solution is do unto others as you would like them to do unto you. It's that simple. Who cares what color we are? Who cares what language I speak? If you treat me like you would like me to treat you, and if I treat you like I would like you to treat me, it's going to be okay. And Jesus says this Christianity thing is not about doing. It's about the heart. Why are you doing what you're doing? That's what this Christianity thing is about. Our actions don't make us Christians. Our actions should be a reflection of our Christianity. It's the overflow of the heart. Jesus said in John 13, 35, by this all people will know that you are my disciples. How? If you have love for one another. It's a very clear principle in the Bible. It's so clear that in 1 John 4, 20, listen what it says. If anyone says, I love God, but hates his brother, he's a liar. 
Wow, that's pretty strong. He says, if anyone says, I love God and hate his brother, he's a liar. For he, does not, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God because he has not sinned. You see, if I claim to love God, if I claim that I'm a Christian, but I hate somebody, I'm lying. I'm not really a Christian. It's very clear in there. So here we are at, at the crux of the matter, right? We, 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 I can imagine that, that the disciples, like probably us, are looking at this thing and going, wow, Christianity is really difficult. Jesus, this is difficult. This is hard, right? Well, let me tell you, no, it's not difficult. It's impossible. Christianity without Christ is impossible. And many of us are trying to live a Christian life without God in it. And it's impossible. It's not just difficult. It's impossible. That's why I think Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, listen, guys, you need to make a decision. You know all the rules. You know everything I taught you. You're good learners. You're smart. Now you need to make a decision. You need to make a decision. And that's where we find them on verse 13. He says, enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Let me read that again. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. I love Jesus when he talks because he doesn't play around. You know, Jesus says it right like it is, right? Don't you love that about him? I, I hate when people come to me and try to tell me something, you know, and they start flowering it up. And you're like, can you just get to the point? I mean, I know every man here understands me right now. <laughs> Women are going, well, why? Why go so straight to the point? Anyways. <laughs> Baby, I love you. We're okay, right? <laughs> Jesus starts with a command. Enter by the narrow gate. This is not a suggestion. He's looking at his disciples and saying, listen, enter by the narrow gate. And this is interesting for me because it reminds me of when my kids, you know, I wanted them to eat the vegetables. And you say, eat your vegetables. What's the next question? <laughs> Happened to you too, huh? <laughs> Why? And then sometimes, right? Most of the time, hopefully, we proceed to explain why they have to eat their vegetables and why it's better than ice cream and all that stuff. And Jesus does kind of the same thing here. He says, enter by the narrow gate. And he knows the question, uh, why? And then he proceeds to give an explanation of why we should enter the gate. You see, he's giving them a command, and this command requires a decision. See? And this is a personal command this morning. So he's giving you and me a personal command that requires a personal decision this morning. Enter by the narrow gate. So now in order to make our decision, let's look at the destinations. Just like when we travel. There are two destinations. He's giving us two destinations in, in this passage. And I think it's necessary for us to understand the destinations before we can make the decision. Right? Now the destinations are two. Life or death. Restoration or destruction. And like I put in your outline, heaven or hell. Heaven or hell. You know, all men, all human beings were made to last for all eternity. All of us are going to last for all eternity. We need to know where we're going to spend it. 
And the only two choices, the only two destinations are heaven or hell. Now, how many of you love to talk about heaven? Hmm, I'm surprised. I thought everybody was going to raise their hands. <laughs> but how many love to talk about hell? Can we spend an hour talking about hell? I got one. The rest, you're not allowed to sleep. All right? <laughs> Listen, before we go into that, not making a decision is making a decision. I want to make that clear this morning, okay? Not making a decision is making a decision. I hope you understand that. In the last 25 years or so, there's been a movement developed in the Protestant community called Protestant liberalism. And these liberals, they didn't set out to destroy Christianity as we know it, but in their opinion, they wanted to save Christianity. They wanted to rescue it from itself. And Albert Moeller wrote that um, in 2011, these people had a problem with talking about hell. Historian Gary Dorian of the Union Theological Seminary, which is a proponent of Protestant liberalism, observed that it was the doctrine of hell that marked the first major departure from theological orthodoxy in the United States. Nobody wanted to talk about hell. You see, these liberals could not and would not accept the doctrine of hell that included conscious eternal punishment and the pouring of God's wrath upon sin. They just couldn't take it. And we see that in the popularity of the book by Pastor Rob Bell called Love Wins. I don't know if you've read this book, and I really don't recommend you read it. <laughs> oh, man, sometimes, you know, you think things and you shouldn't say them, but they come out. But in this book, Pastor Bell suggests that that the love of God is such that he will not allow anybody to go to hell. You know, his, his love is so, so big that, that, you know what, at the end of it all, love is going to win. He's going to allow everybody into heaven. It doesn't matter how you live, whether you decided for Christ or not. It really doesn't matter. As a matter of fact, he believes that after you die, you can actually receive Christ somewhere thereafter and just go to heaven. You know, and, and I know, I talk to many people in my office, and I've seen many people that tell me, yeah, Jose, I believe in God. I just can't talk about this part of the Bible because God is love. And because God is love, he can't send people to suffer eternally in hell. And you know, they're right. God is love. It says so in 1 John 4, 8. God is love. But what they are forgetting or what they're choosing to ignore it's 2 Thessalonians 1, 6, when it says that God is just. Amen. See, God is love, but God is just. And you and I know that if we go before a judge, and he is a just judge, he will send free the innocent, but he should punish the guilty. Right? I mean, if we go to court and he's punishing the innocent and freeing the guilty, we call that what? Injustice. He is not a just judge. So why do we expect that from God? God is just. And let me tell you, if you don't like to talk about hell, I'm sorry, but it's a very important theme in the Bible. Hell is real, whether you like it or not, whether I like it or not. Revelations 21.8 says, but as far as... As for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. That sounds like hell to me. Revelation 20:15. If anyone's name was not written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. That sounds like hell to me. Matthew 25, 41 and 46, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. 
and they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. In Matthew 10, 28, Jesus says, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. I'm sorry, but that sounds like hell to me. There is a heaven, there is a hell. And Jesus lays the importance of his command here, enter by the narrow gate. Now that we know the two destinations, I will ask you, what destination do you want today? Where do you want your trip to take you? So now that we understand the destination, so let's see what door should I go through in order to get there, right? He mentioned two gates. Two gates. And he simply says one is narrow and one is wide. Very simple description. This reminds me of when you go to a ball game, right? They make you walk through that turnstile. If you ever been there, I love watching some of the people that go through that. You know, uh, forgive me, moms. For mi- forgive me, Mrs. Hill. But, but sometimes parents go with the little baby and the stroller and the bag for the baby, the purse and all this. And they try to get through that turnstile, right? And we just sit back and watch. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> no, I never do that. I always go and help them. But it's very difficult to go through that turnstile with a lot of baggage on you, right? See, that turnstile is made for a purpose. It's made narrow for the purpose of one person going in at a time. And nowadays, they don't just want one to go in. They want to know exactly everything that is on you as you go in one at a time. Now, when the game is over, it's a completely different story, right? When you're going to get out of the stadium and the game is over, they open wide every single door in that place, and we all come out as quickly as possible, right? That's what it reminds me when, when Jesus is talking here about a narrow gate and a wide gate. And that's the idea he's trying to convey. Listen, the gate, one of the gates is wide. You can come through it with all your baggage, There's no changes necessary in your life for you to come in through this gate. It's why. Just bring everything with you. But the other one is narrow. See, when you try to go through that one with all your baggage, you got to drop it. You got to leave that baggage behind. He's saying that gate is narrow. The white gate says that many will find it. Many will enter But the narrow gate, he said, few will find it. Few will find it. You see, this this gate requires self-sacrifice. This gate requires self-denial. And this gate leads to a hard way. You see, there are two ways. There are two gates. There are two ways. The hard way and the easy way. The hard way and the easy way. You know, the easy one is, is the one that most people live in. It's actually the one that we're all born into. We're all born into the easy way. And the easy way comes natural. You know, we like this gate because I don't have to change everything that I'm doing. I can live As everybody else is living, I can feel accepted by everyone else. This is the gate of self-indulgence. This is the gate of self-fulfillment. This is the way of tolerance. This is the way of no moral absolutes. This is the way of doing what seems right to men, but at the end, it leads to death. That is the wide gate. And don't think that everything in this gate is going to be ugly and disgusting and and wretched. You know, that's the problem most of us have. We, We think what is bad looks bad. You know? 
Murder looks bad. Adultery looks bad. Even in the world's eyes. Listen, what's going to get some of us is the righteous that are going to be walking that way. The Pharisees were righteous in their own eyes. Even Jesus said, man, you look like whitewashed tombs. You look pretty nice on the outside. But you're just rotten bones on the inside. And we think that, hey, Jose looks pretty good, so let me just follow Jose. Have you ever done that on a trip? One, my wife and I were in Puerto Rico some couple of years ago, and I was following my GPS. So I left my phone over there. And, you know, we're going through the mountain following the GPS, and all of a sudden, oops, there goes the signal. Nine o'clock at night. We look at each other, and I say, honey, don't worry. I'm going to follow that car because he knows where he's going. Right? You ever done that? <laughs> Normally it gets me out of there. I don't know why, but every time I pick somebody, they go and get me out. But we live our Christian life just that way. You know, he seems to be having fun. You know, Steve Taylor seems to have it all together. I'm just going to follow Steve. And he doesn't look bad. He doesn't kill anybody. He doesn't curse. You know, not everything looks bad in that wide gate. And, and, you know, the problem with choosing is that things actually seem right in this way. You know, they, I can do what I like. You know, my body likes to do things in the white lane. I like to live in the white lane. You know, our sinful nature loves the wide road. It just loves it. That's why we have this battle. Because our nature loves it. And that's the issue with the white gate, with the white road. That is not until something traumatic happens in our lives that we decide, oh my goodness, I need something. I need help. I need to get out of this. In stark contrast to the white lane, Jesus is walking with his disciples in Luke 14. And with a big crowd that is following him. And at this time, Jesus is starting to, to look at the crowd and say, man, we, we, we got to get here who are truly followers of Jesus. Let me see who really is following me. And he gives them an example of a builder and an example of a king. And he looks at them and he says, you better count the cost. You better start counting the cost of following me. In verse 33 of Luke 14, he says, So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Wow. There is a cost to following Jesus. See, the way is hard. is narrow. is constricted. See, you cannot just live the life you've been living when you follow Jesus. The Sermon on the Mount is not just a suggestion for me to live a little bit of a better life. The Sermon on the Mount is a call to drastically and radically change my life. This is the way of sanctification. This is the way where God is going to take you, he's going to mold you, and he's going to work you until he makes you into the person that he made you to be. He has created each and every one of us for a purpose. But he has to mold us, and he has to turn us, and he has to flip us upside down so that he can use us for the purpose that he called us. See, this is the way of transformation. That is spoken of in Romans 12, 2, where it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. This is the way of persecution. As a matter of fact, the word narrow in verse 14 could actually be translated tribulation. This is the way of tribulation and prosecution. But let me tell you this. This is also the way to life. This is also the way to life. Jesus said this way in John 10.10. 10, I came that they may have life and have it how? Abundantly. 
you want to have life abundantly today? The narrow gate. That's the only way to life. In verse 14 he says, For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. See, the wide gate opens to the easy way, which leads to hell. It leads to destruction. But now the narrow gate opens to the narrow way that leads to life, that leads to heaven. There are only two destinations, the easy way or the hard way. And this is the thing, like I said before, all of us are born into the easy way. All of us. There's no exception. Everybody that is born in this world, even little Sayomi, was born into the easy way. We are born and on our way to destruction. It says in in John 3.17, we all know John 3.16, but in verse 17 it says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. See, Jesus didn't come to tell us how bad we were. It says, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Check out verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. They are already condemned. Everybody's born into the wide lane. We're all going to condemnation, to destruction. Not all roads lead to heaven, my friends. Not all roads lead to heaven. And not everyone is going to be saved. Pastor Rob Bell is wrong. Not everyone is going to be saved. That's why we see two types of people in here. There are two groups of people. The saved... And the condemned, the few that find the narrow way, and the many that stay on the wide road. See, so this morning, we have to choose. And I'm going to tell you this, choose your destination wisely. Choose your destination wisely. The reason Jesus started with a command is because he's making the point that the only way to heaven is the narrow gate. The reason he started with that command, enter the narrow gate. He's making the point there is only one that you can choose. See, supposedly we have two options, but we're already running on one of them. That's why I said to not do anything is doing something. To not decide this morning is to stay in the white lane. It's funny because uh, throughout the Bible, God had given his people the same choices. In Jeremiah 21, in Deuteronomy 30, he continuously offers them life and death. And In Deuteronomy verse 19 in in chapter 30 says, I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. And then he says, therefore, choose life. In Joshua 24, we're all familiar with that. In in Joshua 24, Joshua brings the, the, the city of Israel, brings all the Israelites out and says, listen, make up your minds. Choose this day whom you're going to follow. Are you going to follow the gods of Egypt? Are you going to follow the ones of the Amorites? Choose. You're going to follow life? Or death. What do you want? He says, but as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. See, and Jesus is just asking the same question here. Jesus says, which gate are you going to choose? There is a narrow gate. There is a wide gate. There's one that leads to life. There's one that leads to destruction. Choose. Okay, you might say this morning, okay, Jose, I understand. The narrow gate leads to a narrow path that leads to life. The white gate leads to a wide path that leads to destruction. 
Okay, I got it. How do I find the gate? If I want to find the narrow gate that he said few will find it, how do I find it? Where is it at? How do I open that door? The only choice, my friend, is Jesus. That's the answer to your question. The only choice is Jesus. The way of life is Jesus. The narrow gate itself is Jesus. Jesus said in John 10, 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. In John 14, 6, he says, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. And then he says, and no one comes to the Father except through me. In 1 Timothy 2, 5, he says, for there is only one God. And there is one mediator. How many? One. Between God and man. And his name is Jesus. My friend, where is your road map leading you to today? Is it leading you to life? Or is it leading you to destruction? Where are you going? Do you think you're a Christian this morning, but you know you're living in the white lane? Do you look the same as everybody else that looks around you? Do you do the same things? Do you behave the same way? Do you talk the same way? Do you like the same things? That way is easy. Are you sacrificing? You, are you dying to yourself every day? Or are you just doing what pleases you? Because you have enough money to do it? Or because you have enough friends to do it? Or because it's secret enough that nobody knows about it? Or because it's just here and nobody can tell? Listen, don't kid yourself. There's only two ways. And the way to life requires self-sacrifice. It requires for me to die to myself every day, every hour, every minute, and God knows, sometimes every single second. The way is narrow. The way is hard. And without Christ, it's impossible to live it. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sins is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I know nobody likes to talk about hell. I like, I know it. I don't like it either. But there is a reality. There is a heaven. There is a hell. We're born on our way to destruction. The wages of sin is death. And you cannot save yourself. You need Jesus because he is the gate. It says in 1 John 5, 12, whoever has the son has life. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever has the son has life. You know, the moment, the instant you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have life. Life eternal. You may not be perfect. I am not perfect. I thank God that none of us are perfect. But God is molding us. He's working on us. And man, it makes life tough. It is tough to walk in the narrow path. I know it. I go through the same struggles you do. My, my heart wants to do something and my mind says, no, you know, you shouldn't be doing it. Oh, but it feels so good. You know, I remember when I quit smoking back in 1990. Man, my body wanted a cigarette. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to smoke. God, please hold it. And the body was like, but it feels so good. He'll say, with a cup of coffee right after dinner, 
You sit in the patio, you smoke that stoke, can't even go there. It's hard. And without Jesus, it's impossible. So my sister, my brother, my friend, this morning you have a choice to make. I don't know where you're at in your walk. I don't know if you believe or don't. I don't know if you're here by accident or you think you're here by accident or not. But believing in the sovereignty of God, I'm telling you this, you're here because you needed to be here. And this morning, Jesus is putting before you a choice. There is a narrow gate. There is a wide gate. And you need to choose. Tomorrow may be too late. This afternoon may be too late. And I'm not trying to freak anybody out. I'm not trying to make you feel like, oh, my goodness, if I don't do this. It's between you and God. You know, it doesn't affect me. But I love you so much, I want you to understand that well. Today, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, man, choose life. And it's very simple to do. If you want to do it today, just come down here while we're praying, while we're singing, and just come and talk to me. Either myself or one of the elders or one of the deacons will lead you into how to do it this morning. It's very simple. It's very easy. But the life becomes hard. The walk becomes hard. See, becoming a Christian is the easy part. Living the Christian life, that's another story. Amen.